Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's workshop, Thinking Like a Watershed, Community Scale Climate Adaptation and Resilience in the North Quabbin, led by Connor Stedman. My name is Maria Elena Lima and I'm the Communications and Engagement Coordinator for Mount Graceland Conservation Trust. We partnered with North Quabbin Energy to organize this great event, so I'm going to turn it over to Janice Krakowski to give a brief introduction to North Quabbin Energy. Yeah, hi, um, my name's Janice Kirkowski. I see quite a few other people associated with North Quabbin Energy on this call. Um, Anna Georgie, Diane Nassif, John and Judy, Don and Judy Campbell from years ago. We've been an organization of fairly loose organization <laughs> since 2005. But um, when the, um, when an issue comes up like a natural gas pipeline or a biomass burning plant, we pull together and try to wrap our heads around what this really means for the environment. So um, our, our main uh, goal is to self-examine our use of energy, where it's wasted and how we can do better. And once we get that under control, we, we, um, we look at efficiency and renewables. But um, we do try to think like a watershed when it, and connect the dots when it comes, particularly to energy use and our patterns of, con of overconsumption. So you're welcome to visit our website and um, join a meeting if you want. Um, we're, again, mostly represented by the towns in the North Quabbin area. Thanks, Janice. So before I introduce Connor, I'm going to take two minutes to speak about Mount Graceland Conservation Trust. Mount Grace is an innovative and collaborative regional land trust that has been conserving the open spaces and local farms that are important to our communities in North Central Massachusetts since 1986. Um, as climate change continues to impact our region and beyond, Mount Grace is committed towards addressing climate change in a number of ways. Uh, first and foremost, we treat land protection as the primary defense against the issues exacerbated by climate change. And we actually have this really cool strategic biodiversity conservation map that one of our partnerships, the North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnership, created uh, that helps us determine which land conservation projects uh, should be prioritized in our region. In addition to land conservation, uh, we know that sustainable forest management and creating a more resilient food system are key to more resilient economies and communities. And so we continue our stewardship program and facilitation of the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance. Uh, in that vein, uh, the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance is an informal network that works together to address the food system challenges in our communities. Um, and namely, they're working on food waste reduction and composting at the moment. So definitely um, some great solutions for uh, mitigating climate change. Um, I just want to thank um, all of our Mount Grace members that are on the call participating. Um, without you, we wouldn't have been able to conserve the 35,000 acres of agricultural, natural, and scenic land without the support of our members. And so if you're not a member, I would greatly encourage you to consider joining if it's in within your means at this time. New members allow Mount Grace to grow and accelerate the pace of land protection in our region which is greatly needed due to the threat of climate change. Um, by supporting Mount Grace, we can hold more educational events around climate change solutions and continue our work of the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance. So with that said, I'm going to introduce Connor Stedman. He is an ecological designer, farm planner, an educator working to mitigate climate change while strengthening viable farm businesses and rural economies. Connor is a lead designer with Appleseed Permaculture and Terra Genesis International, lead faculty at the Mo Omega Institute's Center for Sustainable Living, and an instructor and advisor in UVM's Leadership for Sustainability program. He teaches regionally and nationally on responding to climate change through policy, planning, and design. We're very excited to have him lead this workshop, so take it away, Connor. Thank you, Marielena, much too kind. And good evening, everyone. Um, I will share my screen in a moment, but I just want to say hello without the, without the slideshow for a second. 
Um, I know that my lighting is a little unideal here with the vagaries of where we can broadcast from from our homes. So this is a little little radio free Europe for you all. Um, uh, but that's kind of the times we're living in where things are things are a little less than perfect. And um, and that's and that's actually deeply related to what we're working on tonight. So um, so I work as Marielena so kindly said with uh, businesses and organizations and communities on wrapping our minds around what the heck climate change is and means for now and the future. Um, and, you know, the, there's a temptation. It's, it's really, it's like, um, it's an enormous thing to try to address in an hour and a half. It's a little bit it's a little bit foolish, really. So, um, so we're gonna do our best. Um, but I wanna suggest some orientations to this topic um, and to the work of thinking about climate change as a community of a place and as a community of a region, um, and also as individuals and as citizens. So one of, you know, one of the orientations I wanna suggest and invite people to try out here is, um, for you to not believe anything I say tonight. Um, so I am not here in the position of an expert. I am here in, the, in a position of an educator and that's a different thing. So, the, so my primary job tonight is not to share information or to persuade you of information. Um, I will be sharing information and I will be sharing information that may be challenging or uncomfortable at times and and so I'm very interested in the opportunity of what can arise when we bump up against, bump up against challenging information. Um, but the primary focus of tonight is not, on, um, is not on the future of climate doom. Um, and, and it's also not on trying to dissect exactly which climate scenarios are or aren't going to happen. All of that information is out there. There's huge bodies of research and thought on this um, that you can access. What I wanna do tonight is a little different than that. I want to create a series of conversations and pose a series of questions that are going to ask us to do something more challenging than take in information. And that's to engage with the idea of playing a role in a system. So the, so the idea of a human role that is unique to each of us as individuals, because the, you know, there is a, there is like an atomizing of our attention and also of the options for our actions right now that I think social media is accelerating. And that atomizing is presenting the idea that there's a limited range of actions we can take and someone else is gonna tell them what they should be. So, uh, so my approach for these conversations about climate resilience in communities is not to propose specific strategies or to propose specific courses of action, but to propose systems of questions that invite you to determine that's the role that I could imagine myself playing in this, um, you know, in this quite enormous and challenging situation. Um, the climate situation defies any one strategy or any one approach. There, I am, I'm going, this is one of the things that, again, I invite you to not believe me, but think about it for yourself. Um, the the prem, one premise that I'm starting from is that climate change defies a single correct approach and that the the idea that there are best practices that if everyone applied them we would get out of this situation i think is not well backed by the science um the magnitude of what we're facing um i think quite clearly points to the idea that uh there's a there's a much larger range of what needs to be considered and undertaken than the idea of there being a single climate solution or a single climate policy. So that's one reason is the magnitude and complexity of the problem. The other reason that I'm not here to propose best practices or a simple set of solutions is because of the uniqueness of each community and each region and place. So this, we're gonna take a look at, you know, and really you're gonna take a look at this, this place of the North Quabbin tonight, this, this very unique, geography, this very unique, um, you know, system of stories and memories and histories that lives here. Um, but we have people on this call who are from 
Mississippi and Spokane, Washington and Vermont and other places who are here because they want to think about their, their own distinct and unique regions and communities. So, um, so one of the invitations I want to make is really a move beyond the idea of checklists or top 10 lists in, in response to this topic. Um, and so the other, the, the first orientation being don't believe what I'm saying. The second one is don't reject what I'm saying if it makes you uncomfortable. But look at why it makes you uncomfortable and look at what paradigms or perspectives it might be challenging and then don't believe it, but go do your own research and your own thinking and see what new thoughts and ideas you come up with. Um, again, the, the, the orientation here is to, towards learning and that means not having experts. That means having questions to follow. So that's some of the philosophy behind what we're doing tonight. Um, and we're going to, at a couple points in the evening, put everyone into breakout rooms, as you may have experienced before on Zoom. And we're going to be inviting you to have a discussion with maybe people who are your neighbors, maybe people who you've never met before, maybe people who live in far-flung parts of the world. You'll, we'll see who the, um, the Zoom magicians um, put, put you all with. Um, but to have some conversations that are um, asking some of these questions of uniqueness and asking some of these questions of the roles and positionality that you might be able to be in and play. Um, because the other perspective that I'm starting from here is that what is right for one person in addressing something as complex and challenging as climate change will not necessarily be right for another person. And that actually each of us, we are the only people who can determine that for ourselves. So there's not an authority who's telling you, here's what you're supposed to do about climate change. Um, that's certainly not the role that I want to claim or put myself in. So with a little bit of, with a little bit of background there on, on the, the way of thinking behind what we're doing tonight, um, you know, I'll just say that I currently am working on projects ranging from um, you know, a, a triple net zero living building affordable housing development in, in a city in upstate New York to a thousand acre ranch development project in Southern California that is trying to restore steelhead spawning habitat in the headwaters of the Santa Inez River um, to, you know, projects that are looking at how to advance the possible, the real potential for carbon sequestration through agriculture and through forest management and through, you know, the, the hope that maybe environmental markets could play some role in this. We don't know yet. We'll have to see. Um, but so there's a, um, there's a bias I'm bringing into this, which is that I primarily work in land use and I primarily work in land use and forestry and agriculture. And that is only one component. That is only one arena of climate solutions. Um, there are vast other arenas that relate to renewable energy, like Marilena was speaking to, and relate to um, issues of the built environment and the material, the material world that we work with, and that also relate to, you know, really significant questions of waste and, and emissions reduction. Um, and so some of the examples I'm going to be giving tonight, some of the stories I'm going to be telling are focused on land use, but I don't want to suggest that land use is the only thing we have to do. Um, it's, it's a component of a, of a bigger picture. So, um, so with that in mind, I am going to attempt the very dangerous thing of sharing my screen here. Um, and we will see what happens. Oh, and the one other thing I'll say is that um, is I do uh, very much invite some of your questions in the chat, in the group chat. Um, however, while I am, while I am sh screen sharing and presenting, I won't be able to see them. So, uh, maybe um, whoever's hosting can also just keep an eye on the accumulation of questions and um, we'll try to address some of those as we go. Sound good? All right, I see some nods from the organizing crew and some acceptance from others. So hopefully we can proceed. Okay, good. If Polo's on board, then I'm, I'm going full steam ahead. Um, my friend Polo is here from Spokane, Washington. So cool to have you here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And we're gonna go to this. All right, does that look the way it ought to? I think probably it does. And I'm gonna play this slideshow. Okay, so where to begin here? Where to begin? Um, you know, I wanna begin in 
the moment of um, 200,000 deaths in the US from the coronavirus pandemic. And, um, and just to consider the possibility that, um, that this is a, a small fraction of what's coming from the compounding effects of climate change in the decades ahead. Um, you know, in, I think there is a, uh, there's a very interesting quality of the pandemic that it has been a stress test on so many of the systems in our society and has been ex like surgically revealing the places where our society is not working and, and the places where there's deeply unequal results from our society. Um, and climate change is like that in spades. Climate change is an enormous stress tester and it is an enormous multiplier of inequality. So, um, so you know, it, there's kind of like, it's been a hard year and it may be one of the easier ones we have for a long, for a long time to come in different ways. So um, we may also have been given a chance to practice some of the skills of resilience that we're gonna need for the long term. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna bombard you with lots of terrible things about the climate situation, um, but you know, the, uh, one of the things about the climate situation is that um, in terms of the carbon cycle, the effects from carbon dioxide that we experience right now are the result of emissions that happened at least 20 years ago. So because there's a lag in the, in the assumption of the position in the atmosphere where the greenhouse gas effect fully takes place. So that's not true of the methane cycle. So there's different dynamics with different greenhouse gases. Um, but this is related to the fact that the effects that we're seeing right now of increased hurricanes in the Atlantic and flooding and the you know, calamitous wildfires on the West Coast and sea level rise and drought, um, they are uh, significantly worse effects than these are already locked in to our future experience from the legacy of the legacy of um, fossil fuel emissions. And there's a couple of things about that legacy that I want to point out. One of them is that the majority of surplus emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution have been emitted since 1980. So, uh, so this is not primarily a first two thirds of the 20th century issue, or, and it is not primarily a 19th century issue. This is primarily a last 30 or 40 years issue. Um, in terms of the accumulation of greenhouse gases and the translation of that into what we're seeing now. This is a very recently accelerating problem. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing that is also valuable to see, and this is another topic for another night and another conversation, is that only about half of the total accumulated emissions are from fossil fuels. The other half are from land degradation. So that's from deforestation, that's from the plowing of prairies into farmland, that's from replacing natural places and all the carbon that they store with the built environment. Um, and so land degradation in many cases is a reversible process and fossil fuel emission is not a reversible process. So that gives an idea that um, there are biological processes that can par at least partially undo some of what's been done to our atmosphere. Um, but we are on a wicked short timeline, my friends, for how to do that and how to do it in a thoughtful way. So, um, so climate change is a challenge that confronts some of our habitual ways of thinking and really demands that we think rigorously, in my opinion. And, and so I want to just propose that there are a few common cognitive biases that can come into play with how we perceive and think about climate change, and that it may be valuable to watch, you know, someone was talking about um, self-observation earlier, that we can practice some self-observing and watch our own thinking about climate change. Um, so one of them is that there's, there's actually quite a bit of social science research on the recency bias in climate thinking and climate communication, that when people think of climate change, we're often thinking about what we've personally observed over the last five to eight years. Um, ver and that really obscures the longer arc of what's happening, including the arc beyond the next five to eight years, which is where some of the really scary effects start to take place. Um, but that's related to what I'm calling the not in my backyard bias, which is the idea of, I don't see it personally, it's actually not happening. 
um, you know, of course, this cognitive, this cognitive bias is at play in the deep challenges that so many white folks have in grappling with racism. Because if I don't personally experience it, it must not be that big of a deal, right? Um, and, you know, I think you can see that the problem with that in, with racism and with climate change, that um, the effects of these crises are unevenly distributed. They're, and, and they're actually dramatically unevenly distributed. So that gets to, you know, one of the biggest things that I think we have to confront as people who live in Massachusetts and people who live in New England and people who live in the Northeast, especially the inland Northeast, which is that there is a very big momentum towards valuing what's happening with climate change in the global north over what's happening in the tropics and the global south. And, and also I would include the Arctic in that, you know, because, because politically the Arctic is not really part of the global north. It's a, re, you know, occupied resource colony of global north nations. And, and the heaviest and most severe effects of climate change, I'm, I'm speaking right now to the people who live in, you know, New England and the inland, the inland northeast, the most severe effects are not happening here and not even close. Um, and and that's true within the US, as we can see from wildfires and hurricanes and, and severe floods elsewhere, but it's even more true globally. A very, very big percentage of the global climate change story is in the global south and the tropics and the Arctic. And what that means is that I want to propose and, and challenge people a little bit to consider that as people who live in the part of the world where we do, and again, I'm speaking to us New Englanders here, we have a fundamentally inaccurate understanding of what's happening globally because our day-to-day -day experience is giving is giving us the information that we would get living in a place that is one of the most sheltered places on the entire planet from the effects of climate change um, and those effects have been significant here already the effects of hurricanes irene and sandy have been really significant the effects of increasing frequency of droughts have been significant the effects of flooding have been significant, not, not just from tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, the effects of, you know, weirding temperatures and weirding seasons have been significant. But what I want to suggest that we really grapple with is that they are significantly less than most of what the rest of the planet has already experienced. And so that means that it actually requires, it requires stretching beyond our own experience to really take in what's happening to the larger planetary system that we're part of. Um, and it also, I think, it also proposes some questions about what is the role of regions that act as refuges? What is the role of regions that are significantly sheltered from some of the worst outcomes in relation to their neighbors and in relation to other communities and regions in the world? We'll come back to that a little later. Um, there's also, especially in you know, white dominated environmental movements in North America. Um, there is a tendency sometimes to focus on the environmental effects of climate change and, and not focus as much on the economic and social effects. So I just wanted to make some of those explicit. Um, it's clear from the available science that climate change is one of the most significant humanitarian and equity crises that have ever happened on the planet. Um, so you know, without rapid decarbonization in the next eight to 10 years, and that's, and, and the most fascinating thing about these climate models, and I've spent a lot of time looking at this data, the most fascinating thing about the climate models is that the biggest single variable in the climate models and why there's so much variability about what'll happen in the future is because the actions of about, of the European Union and about five other countries are the biggest variable in those models. The future actions of the EU, the US, Russia, India, China, and Brazil are the biggest variable. And they're the, they're the part of it that's been written the least and they actually have some of the most influence on where this ends up. So that means we're, we're standing at an incredibly important and powerful moment in history right now. Um, you know, one of my, friends and inspirations in climate work, this woman Diane from Seattle, she likes to say, if you ever wanted to feel like you are living a significant life, uh, I have good news for you. Um, now's a great time to be alive because what we do right now is of outside significance. Um, so, you know, we also get to then confront, oh, what does it mean if, if my life is actually significant? What does it mean if I actually do have the ability to make a difference? Um, so, by the way, these numbers are coming from places like the UN and the EPA here. These are, these are um, at the 
kind of mainstream center of climate science currently, which, you know, we can talk about where that is in the spectrum of what people think. But the UN, the UN's median estimate is that in 30 years, there will be over 200 million people displaced from their home by climate change, um, it, you know, without radical changes in the next eight years or so. Um, 200, million, 200 million people um, as displaced people or refugees. Right now in the world, there's about 30 million of those people. So that's a, that is a big difference. Um, the, you know, in the next 30 years, you know, before accounting for inflation and the effects of other things, um, the average price of staple foods is predicted to almost double just from the effects of climate change alone. So imagine spending twice as much as we currently do on food um, in, in a few decades. Uh, by the end of the century, there are expected to be over a billion people in China alone who are affected by water scarcity. That's just in one country. Now, of course, a very big country. Um, and uh, the, again, the UN projects that by the end of the century, the total global economic damages or losses from climate change will exceed $600 trillion. So, and in fact, some of those projections say that the, 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 the economic damages will be essentially infinite because it will not be possible to continue having organized societies. So, um, and that's what the UN says. That's not what, that's not what, you know, fringe climate futurists say. So, um, so I really want to drive home that, again, for you to encounter and think about that um, it's an environmental crisis, but maybe even more so it's a social crisis and it's an equity crisis because the the wealthier half of the world has produced, by some calculations, 95% of surplus emissions since 1800. And that means that the less wealthy half of the world has produced 5% of those emissions. And yet those are the people who are experiencing these effects the most strongly. And that's true within countries as well as globally. So we have a, we have a very interesting rest of our lives ahead um, with the outcomes of all this. So I want to zoom in now to place. And you know, I started with talking about best practices and top 10 lists and checklists and why this, this challenge really confounds those ways of thinking and acting. And one of the reasons I believe is because each place on the earth is not just different from other ones, but it actually possesses uniqueness. There is uniqueness to the North Quabbin. There is uniqueness to, um, you know, the, even just the neighboring and surrounding regions that have a different story, they have a different fundamental nature, they have a different essence, and they have a different set of conditions and histories and, and legacies because of that. So I just wanted to connect us a little bit to this place. And, you know, there may be people who'd say, oh, no, the map, that's not the right map, it should be over here. Oh, no, that's, there's all kinds of things on this map that aren't the North Quabbin, I'm sure that's true. Um, but just to start us orienting and also to look at something without borders and labels, um, this is just a photograph from space of this place, or at least a, a real portion of this place. Um, and you know, you can see already that there's neighboring places represented here. There's the Connecticut River Valley, you know, north is up on this map. Connecticut River Valley on the west side of the map, the, the Monadnock region in the north, which you know, some people would say it's really part of the same region. Some people would say it's different. Um, and, and so what I want to do, and maybe we're almost ready to do our first breakout room. How are we doing? Um, how are we doing, Kathy, on that? Breakout rooms are ready. Okay, grand. So what I want to do is holding this place in mind. And for those of you kind people who are visiting from other regions right now, when we go into a breakout room, I invite you to think about the place where you live. Um, because what I, want to, what I want us to think for just a few minutes about is uniqueness of place. So here's two ways. I'm going to ask the same question in two different ways. Oh, it sounds like there's someone who could be muted. Um, I'm going to ask the same question in two different ways here. One way is what is unique about the North Quabbin region? What makes here here? So what tells you that you are here? What tells you that you're in the North Quabbin? Um, that could be answered through poetry and stories and experiences, right? Not just scientific information. And then the second, another way of asking it is, what is distinctive about the bedrock geologies, the soils, the hydrologic systems, water systems, the ecosystems, and the patterns and histories of human presence in this place? What is distinctive about those things um, 
that tell you that you are here when you are here. So we're gonna give you all just a little bit of time in a breakout room to have a conversation about some of these questions. What is unique and distinctive about the North Quadlin? People are, people are rolling back in. So before we go back to slides, I would love to hear from a few people, either through unmuting yourself or in the chat. Um, you know, maybe we'll start with folks who are indeed in this North Quabbin region. Um, what did you come up with? How do you, how do you know that you're here? What is unique and distinctive about this place? So if there's, if there's a few people who would be willing to share, I think that'd be great to hear across the rooms that we just had. All right, people say moose, so many trees. Mm -hmm. Huge variety of landscape soils, geologies, plus layers of history. Okay. The forest and different bodies of water. Right, there's lots of water in the North Quabbin, isn't there? And some of it is recently constructed. Yeah, one of the largest unfiltered water supplies in the world. Right, and, and a and a policy, a policy and planning regime that led to that too, right? Because the Quabbin was a product of governance and a, and a product of policy. Yeah, there's lots of protection open space. So I'm gonna, this is good. I'm gonna encourage people to go a little deeper here because these are really good descriptors and qualities of the North Quabbin. But, but in, with a few exceptions, a lot of these things aren't necessarily unique to the North Quabbin. They're true of a lot of the surrounding regions also. So go a little further. How do you know that you're home? How do you know you're not in the Connecticut Valley anymore? How do you know that you've come out of the Monadnock, Monadnock region or that you have made it out of the Merrimack Valley to the Northeast? Something about the people, uh-huh. Stone walls, uh-huh, yep, but also not distinctive to the North Quabbin, right? Because the, you know, there's a whole geography of land that for about 50 or 60 years was a commodity export landscape of merino wool, right? Where, you know, we think of you know, palm oil plantations and, um, you know, coconut production and, and cacao farming, these kind of global export commodities, but that's what it was like here for the first half of the 19th century. It was, a, it was a global export market for wool, and that was what deforested most of this region before the American Civil War, and, and the, the building of 95 plus percent of these stone walls happened during that time. No, the Quabbin, yes, the Quabbin is really unique, isn't it? The, and for those who are from outside the region, the Quabbin is this great reservoir um, that was seized by the state of Massachusetts using eminent domain in the early 20th century. There was four towns who, the, they, the state bought the whole town using eminent domain and flooded it with a dam to create a drinking water supply for Boston. So it is a unfiltered drinking water supply or untreated drinking water supply for Boston. New York City has similar things in the Catskills um, and so it's very, it's very amazing. Um, and it's, a, it's also a legacy of displacement. Yeah, the large number of moose is distinctive within Southern New England. Yes, no, that's true. Within Southern New England, um, you know, definitely some of the most uh, resilient so far moose habitat regions. Um, but of course, what we think of as Southern New England is mostly a product of political boundaries, right? Because um, you know, the, the place doesn't necessarily change once you cross state lines. In some cases it does when the state line is a geographic divide like the Connecticut River. Yeah, there's bogs. There's bogs in the North Quabbin, aren't there? And so that's starting to get to some of the deeper distinctivenesses, right, of the bedrock geologies and the particular story of how this land was formed and then the ecosystems that formed on top of that. The secret area, yeah, that's really amazing, right? It's kind of like the flyover country of Massachusetts, right? It's like the North Dakota of Massachusetts um, in the sense that people whose like framework is focused on Boston or focused on Western Mass kind of travel through it. Um, that's, a very, that's a very interesting thing about the experience of the place. 
Yeah. So this, these are really good. These are really good things to explore. And I want to North Dakota, Massachusetts. And I say that with great respect, right? Like the, the flyover country of North America has really been denigrated in people's minds, um, you know, by the idea that all the good stuff happens on the coast. Um, but, but we know that's not true. So I want to encourage you to keep asking these questions and keep, when you're driving around, try to notice when do you arrive here? When do you arrive in the North Quabbin? And how do you know? Because the premise I want to suggest is that there are actually underlying kind of essential things about the place that are telling us when we're home or when we're here. And, you know, the other thing is that when we're talking about uniqueness, you know, one way to think about this is the uniqueness of an individual person, right? So if you think about someone who you care for in your life, someone who you're closely connected to, um, and, you know, maybe you're speaking at, you know, it's heartbreaking, but maybe you're speaking at their funeral, you're giving a eulogy, or maybe you're celebrating them um, at a, a wedding or a birth or a graduation. And, you know, how do people celebrate people like that at these big moments of change? It's usually with stories, right? It's with like, you know, this amazing, hilarious thing that happened one time, or this time when I saw this person's kindness and generosity so clearly. Um, it's, it's, it's usually stories that people share. And so, you know, I don't want to suggest that the uniqueness of a place is only understood through science. Um, it's also understood through poetry and through stories and through, and through the felt experience. But, the, but similarly, and in another way, if we really want to understand the uniqueness of a person, we have to understand the hardship that they've come from also. We have to understand the, the grief and trauma that they may have arisen out of or that are in their family lines. We have to understand the, you know, the unbearable experiences that shaped who they are. And I believe that that's true of places as well. You know, so places are not just our current time experience of them. They're not just how they feel to us right now they are an accumulation of histories and they're an accumulation of the influence of those histories. And that means sometimes that they, that includes histories and experiences that might be very different from our own, right? So, you know, the North Quabbin and South Quabbin, other parts of central Massachusetts, um, you know, the, what is the, what is the awareness and the relationship to the Nipmuc nation here? What is the relationship to an understanding of and kind of living current reality of that history? Um, you know, and one really amazing place to go in exploring that is, you know, we've been given a really big gift by the work of Lisa Brooks at Amherst College. Um, she's an Abenaki woman who's a historian of Native people in what's now called New England. And she has this breathtaking history called Our Beloved Kin. And it's a history of the so-called King Philip's War in the late 17th century from a native point of view and from a women's point of view. Um, it's totally profound and it's not written from the perspective of Western history, right? So it actually takes work on the part of the reader to read it because she's speaking in native place names, not in I-95 and I-90, you know, she's not speaking in modern orientations. Um, and she's also kind of, um, you know, confronting us with things that happened right under our noses, historically speaking. Um, so I really recommend spending time with that work. Um, you know, similarly, you know, there are histories of, there are histories of sundown towns in this part of the world. And there's a, sometimes there's a, there's another cognitive bias for, especially white northerners, where we think that racism is in the south. Um, but the the legacies of those things are very much alive in this land and and so there's some really amazing history that's been done documenting some of those experiences in you know even rural new england um and so that's that's really valuable to look at too and it's also a place of immigrant immigrant experiences and it's a place of sometimes interact intersecting and crashing into each other and conflicting experiences by different groups of people so some of the stories of a place are the ones we're familiar with but a lot of them are the ones that we may be deeply unfamiliar with and they're still real they're still part of what makes a place here so you know this is like 
this is like the hidden stories in a person's life that you have to get to know to really understand them. So that's just an encouragement to, you know, keep asking the questions of where am I? And even if it's a place I've lived my whole life, what have I never noticed? You know, what, is, what has been happening this whole time that hasn't been visible to me? What did I hear or see once and never again, the, the singular events that are actually really important? So, you know, I don't wanna enclose this because these, you know, something I've encountered over and over again is that these places where we live and work are actually, they're much wilder and stranger and more interesting than we sometimes give them and ourselves credit for. Like these places are really cool and really wild in how they've arrived at where we are now. And so you can start to un pack some of those stories and maybe some of those stories are the stories of your own lifetimes you know maybe you are one of the people in those stories um, who, who experience something that people around you have it so those are good things to look at and um, and they're part of understanding this question of what's unique about where we are and they're part of understanding the question of how are we going to engage with what's happening because you know climate change is another one of those things where um, how I feel about climate change and whether I want it to be happening or not has very little to do and maybe nothing to do with whether it's actually happening and, and what the effects are going to be. So um, I was going to go back to the slides. And, and so we're going to skip ahead just to one particular idea here, which, and I'm not going to go back into breakout rooms right now because I want us to keep moving, but I want to encourage this idea of this is from a different paradigm. This is from a paradigm of ranching and grazing management, okay? Um, so there's a body of work called holistic management and it has its own history, it has its own complexity, but it has some powerful ideas in it. And one of them is the idea that, um, it, one of them is the idea that as individuals or as organizations, we have a whole under management. Now, I would challenge the idea of the use of the word whole here, but at least we have a system under management. And so, in other words, there are entities and resources and systems that are under our direct influence. We can actually make decisions that directly affect them every day. It might be the household that I upkeep. It might be the job I have and the people who report to me. It might be um, a landscape that I have fee title to and, and or stewardship responsibility for. It might be organizations and, and clubs and societies that I'm part of and, and a leader in. But there are systems and entities and resources that I can influence. So take a moment to make some notes and think about what are those for you? What, is, what does your whole under management contain? Because it's going, this is something else that is going to be unique for each person on this call here. What is your whole under management? So now I want, you to, I want you to add to that, which is what are some entities or resources or systems that lie beyond your whole under management? In other words, they're too big for you to directly influence right now, but you might be able to influence them through organizing. You might be able to influence them through doing things with friends, doing things with collaboration, doing things collectively. So what are some you know, things that pop out at you at like, that's not quite within my direct influence, but I can see that with some other people, I could get together and we could influence that. What come, does, there's no right answers here. Just write down one or two things that come to your mind. Right, someone wrote in the chat, my social capital and extended friend group, totally. That's a really good example of, um, of something that maybe I can just influence through my own life and presence and maybe I can team up with people and do something together. So I'd actually love for a couple other people to write in the chat, something that surprised you when you thought about this, something you realized you actually have influence over that might be been greater than you realized. Something that might be a little beyond your direct influence, but oh, maybe I could make a difference there. Maybe I could 
round up some other folks and see what we can do together. Uh-huh, right, elections, yeah. Not within my personal individual influence or control, but influenceable through organizing. A sustainability group, the direction the city takes. Okay, that's really interesting, right? So there's a, there's a governance structure. And I just wanna point out what, I just wanna point out what Polo is saying there. There's a governance structure that is made up of many people and it's also made up of laws and customs and all these things and it is influenceable. Maybe not under my personal control, but not unchangeable. North Quabbin Energy, okay, right, an organization that people might be members of or in boards of or leaders of. So this, this is good. These are the kinds of things that are really valuable to think about because, because you know, one of the challenges with climate change has been that some of the options for how to work on climate change that have been presented are very narrow. Like you can kind of like, you know, join 350.org and go to climate marches and that's about it sometimes, or, you know, work on your personal carbon footprint. Um, but I actually think that the scale and pace of our situation requires that we think much more systematically than that. And we think about how to shift whole systems, whole industries, whole governance systems, you know, whole, um, you know, whole ways that resources work in a region. So these are, these are some great ideas people are having here. Okay, so I wanna talk a little about, challenge, about climate challenges and responses, and then we're gonna do one more, one more breakout towards the end. So this is the portion of the evening where I'm gonna do a little bit of talking and kind of presenting of some ideas and information. I'm gonna pause a few times and invite you to do some thinking and, and taking notes like, like we've been doing. So um, please do write questions as you have them in the chat and we'll try to see if we can address one or two of them along the way. So what I'm gonna do is just share some of the best information I've been able to find about how climate change is specifically going to influence this part of the world in the next 30 years, let's say. So this is kind of some of more, the more granular picture of what might be coming. So heat and droughts. Um, we are looking in inland, southern New England at, you know, somewhere between a two and four degree Fahrenheit increase in annual, in average temperatures in the next 30 years, and a four to 10 degree Fahrenheit increase by 2100. Um, that will include substantial increases in heat waves and temperatures over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And those high wet bulb temperatures where it's actually a health hazard to work outside for extended periods of time. Right now that actually very rarely happens in North Quabbin and there might be a week or two a year where that happens um, 20 or 30 years from now. Now, this is one of the, this is one of the areas in which this particular part of the world is quite sheltered from these effects, right? So the, the effects of heat, a heat at least, are substantially mitigated compared to a lot of other parts of North America. Now, we're also already experiencing a real increase in how frequently and how severe and how long we experience droughts. And so that is something that is really likely to accelerate because of changes in precipitation patterns. And now again, we're in nothing like the situation that the arid west is in, where um, you know, there's kind of fundamental ecological system level change happening because of changes in moisture. And, um, but we are in a place where droughts are getting more frequent. So um, you know, when, when I spend three hours on this conversation with groups of people, what I'll often do is I'll have you go back into your groups right now and think about what are the implications of this for your place and community and how would you specifically mitigate heat and droughts where you are. Um, so for right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present one idea of how this can be done on a land use level. And you can probably think of a number of other ones because this is not the only thing. But so tree-based agriculture is one of the big land use tools we have at our disposal for addressing heat and droughts. Um, and it's because of the microclimate effects of trees on their surroundings. So tree cover increases health outcomes in urban places significantly. There's a lot of research on this. There's less particulate pollution. There's fewer premature deaths. Um, of course, there's a very huge environmental racism in which neighborhoods have tree cover and which ones don't. Tree cover has a very significant effect on soil temperature. So soil is 
usually five to 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler under shade. And the, of course, the deeper the shade, the cooler it is. Now that's important because once you get a, once soil temperature gets above 70 degrees, the moisture loss to evaporation goes through the roof. So, you know, a lot of what happens with crops, agriculture, food production is much more about what's happening in the soil than what's happening in the air. And so, you know, if you have a, if you have a soil medium that is retaining water and is, has full vegetative cover and is a cooler growing environment, you can have plants in the, in greater heat and they'll do better. But if your soil is evaporating, losing water, heating and drying up, um, you have less of the ability to do that. Um, and, and also just tree cover and access to shade makes significant differences in animal health and reproduction. So, you know, these are just a few glimpses of the effect of trees in the farm landscape. So, you know, now this, this means we're talking about, we're talking about somewhat esoteric things here, like agroforestry, we're talking about um, tree, you know, tree crops, we're talking about the integration of living forest communities into the working landscape, reforestation. So, you know, something you can think about is, you know, depending on your hole under management, how could you work to scale up tree-based land use within what you currently influence? How could you work to scale up tree-based land use through organizing with others? So you can just take a moment and think about that and, and, and write down any notes that come to you. You may have noticed a lot of darker green on that satellite map of this region. There's a lot of trees here already. So one of the big questions for the future of this region might be, um, how do we keep a lot of that tree cover? and what's happening in the living systems of that tree cover, right? So the New England Food Vision, which is one of the major planning, you know, sort of future focused food system planning documents, imagines that in order to meet regional demand for milk and meat, there will be a significant increase in farmland usage in the next 30 to 40 years. And that a lot of that will come from places that are currently forested. So that's an interesting tension between food security and tree cover, between food security and forest, between food security and carbon, carbon cycling. So how do you do that? Do you do that through silvopasture where if you're clearing forests, you're retaining partial tree cover so that the animals have shade access? Do you do that through you know, strategic planning of belts of conservation land like Mount Grace is trying to do? But these are the kinds of things that the implications of our situation mean we have to work on. Okay, I'm going to see if there's any questions popping up in the chat right now. Um, all local towns are in the state municipal vulnerability program, right? And heat sinks in urban areas are one of the top issues in Athol's plan. That makes sense. And I would expect in places like Fitchburg also. Um, right, because you, you don't need a large urban area to have significant urban heat island effects. And then there's a whole set of implications for public health of that. So thank you for bringing that up, David. Yeah, yeah, and so, right, and solar energy and the replacement of tree cover with solar energy, which is a really wild thing to think about. Um, yeah, I've been in some of those town planning meetings, very fascinating. Um, but, you know, again, to say there's not a simple answer to that, it requires, it requires you know, grappling with what is a rigorous perspective about it. Um, some people come to the conclusion that there's really only certain types of land that are appropriate for solar energy. Some people come to the conclusion that solar energy should primarily be used in the already built environment rather than in the agricultural landscape. Other people come to different conclusions. So, um, you know, it's, it's about the inquiry process here. So, floods. This is something we know a little bit about in this region. So um, again, you know, this is just what the, this is just what the climate models are pointing to for the North Quabbin and surrounding regions. We're looking at a 10 to 20% increase in precipitation by 2050. Now you might say, hold on, Connor, you just said there was going to be more frequent droughts. How can both be true? And the reason for that is that a higher percentage of our precipitation is falling in major storm events. So we're having an increased frequency of both flooding and droughts at the same time. And this is happening in most regions of North America right now, more severely in some than others. Um, there has already been an increase in precipitation over the last 50 years. So there's a, there's a continuation and an acceleration of an existing trend. We're also seeing way more tropical storms and hurricanes 
and that's going to continue. So major, major flood events are here to stay. And it's quite clear that what FEMA has been referring to as a hundred year flood is not accurately understood as a hundred year flood anymore. Um, they do not happen on average every hundred years. You know, when Hurricane Irene hit the region, you know, more a little west of here, but it did impact North Quabbin too. When Hurricane Irene hit the region in 2011, in Vermont, it was the fourth hundred year flood event they had had in three years, right? And of course, Hurricane Irene itself was more like a 500 year event under that way of thinking and what does that even mean anymore? So I wanna to point to the idea of landscape scale water management. And this is where thinking like a watershed becomes really important. And this is where we're really challenged by the way that property in quotes has been organized by private property lines because it's really worth, it's really worth looking into and it's really uncomfortable looking into the history of the private property lines that we organize so much of our lives around now. Um, it's, a good, it's a good thing to do in learning about a, the place where we live is tracing it back to the off, you know, tracing it back to, you know, the, the subdivision and parceling out of once larger units of land and often before that to, um, you know, processes of land patents and land grants and land deeds that were granted to wealthy individuals by governing colonial authorities before this land was part of the United States. And then before that, it's often traced back to, you know, either, you know, some very itchy interactions, you could say, between, between colonial European people and indigenous people, um, often interactions where the two sides of those agreements understood them to mean fundamentally different things about what was being agreed to. And in some cases, the, what the native people understood was that the list of rights was about this long and the list of responsibilities was about this long. Right, so that they were primarily agreements of responsibility rather than of rights. Um, but from the, from the European colonial perspective, it was all about rights. And it was all about you know, total unfettered access and use of the land. So there's a really troubled backstory to most of the private property lines that we live with. And it's troubling now as well, because they generally have almost nothing to do with the natural systems that they sit on. They, because they were drawn through these arbitrary processes. So that's really, that's really difficult for thinking at a watershed scale because some of the most important things about your land from a water point of view are not happening on your property. They're, and some of the most important effects that your property has are not on your property, they're downstream from you. And some of the people who influence you most are upstream from you. So this work of thinking like a watershed at a landscape scale, it, in, it almost inherently requires organizing. It almost inherently requires collective thinking and cooperation across private property ownership. And that's really uncomfortable for the differences in the differences in class status and the differences in resource access that people have. But the amazing thing about climate change is that it's forcing us to have these conversations because the natural world is almost entirely unconcerned with where lines are drawn in the town hall. Um, so, you know, this is a landscape of Wa dry lands water management from Australia here. Um, you know, just look at all those, all that water stored in earthen dam ponds in this photo. So this is a key line design landscape um, that was trying to rehydrate a rapidly degraded landscape from mining and cattle ranching and flax farming in, in the 19th century there. Um, so a couple of things that landscape scale water management sometimes involves, it involves a lot of water storage. So it involves storing more water in the landscape. And that's stored in wetlands, stored in beaver dams, stored in riparian buffer preserves, stored in small earthen ponds, infiltration basins in, in urban places. But it's slowing down the removal of water from the landscape's topography. And that's a very important part of this because when we're in this flood and drought cycle, we have to store the water that comes in the flood so that it can slowly become available to the rest of the landscape and the groundwater for times of drought. Um, also increasing the amount of infiltration and, and decreasing the amount of impermeable surface is a big part of this. I'm not gonna go on the whole side trip here about combined sewer overflows. Um, but suffice it to say that 
Um, in urban and, and peri-urban environments, essentially every bit of water that you take out of the storm drain system is improving the health of downstream water, waterways because of the underground linkage between sewer systems and storm drains, which is, which is in almost every, almost every public water drainage system in the country, at least in this part of the country, and it was almost all built over 100 years ago. Um, and the city of Cambridge actually decoupled their storm, their storm water system from their sewer system, and it cost unfathomable amounts of money to do that. So, and Cambridge, of course, is one of the wealthiest cities in Massachusetts. So, um, so stopping water from ever going into the storm drain in the first place is actually, a, it's an it's a environmental quality priority and it's a public health priority. Um, and so lots of ways to do that. Um, and just moving water through the landscape more slowly rather than more rapidly. So it has time to infiltrate so that it can be used by communities of life and by people along the way. And that means moving water along the contours of the land rather than down and out. So, you know, on a really small scale, people have really learned a lot about how to do this through rain gardens and infiltration basins. These are these very simple technologies that convert low permeability landscapes to high permeability landscapes and landscapes that collect water rather than shed water. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, on the scale of a whole neighborhood block, you can link up a series of these basins, a series of these rain gardens, and you can actually divert water out of the roadway through curb cuts, where you're making an interruption in the curb such that water flows into the basin and then it flows out at the end through another curb cut overflow and then goes into the next one and goes out. And so you basically create a little series of constructed wetlands in your front yard that rain stormwater is going through and they make a really significant difference in the amount of stormwater impact on the below ground piping system and therefore the, the end waterway. So these, again, these are just ecological design ideas for what this looks like on a small scale. On a large scale, a lot of this is about the work of wetland preserves, the work of buffering riparian corridors, the work of increasing the amount of tree cover and vegetation in our, in our waterways. And you know, this is just, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but this is an image of how when the Otter Creek was able to spread out into its wetland preserves um, during Hurricane Irene, the peak velocity of that flood was reduced so much. And of course, it's the peak velocity that determines a lot of how much damage a flood does. So everything that you can do to slow water during flood events and reduce the volume and velocity will make an economic damage savings down the road. So there's a big financial argument for municipalities around this kind of planning too. So, you know, this just points to the question of landscape water management. How would you work on that within your whole under management? How would you organize with other people to work on that where you live? A couple of thoughts on that. Okay. We'll spend a second here on biodiversity and then we're gonna talk about something really big and then we're gonna do one last breakout and call it a night. So um, yeah, biodiversity stresses, they're bad. I'm not gonna go into it all with the time we have, but, but um, this is a familiar story that people can learn about and probably understand a lot about already. Um, but you know, in this region, there's people are talking about the, the unusual moose habitat that for Southern New England that exists in North Quabbin and that population is under a lot of stress. A lot, a lot of stress from increased temperatures, from shorter winters, from increased tick pressure. Um, you know, we're seeing a big northward movement of moose populations right now. Eastern hemlock is under a lot of stress from the woolly adelgid. Cold water fisheries, um, you know, anadromous fish. Uh, it's it's rough out there and, and getting getting more so. So, you know, people talk about a defaunation, a you know, a, a kind of like biocide of communities of life that's been happening. And so I think it points back to a question that we started with about what is the role of a region? What is the role of a place that has so much tree cover? What is the role of a place that has so much conserved land, that has so many natural places, that has these freshwater reservoirs, whether they were built or carved by glaciers and geologic processes? Um, what is the role of a place in being a refuge? Um, maybe a refuge for some of these wildlife species, maybe a refuge for people. 
Um, so I'm going to skip all this horrifying information about insect die off. You all can look this up, but it's pretty bad. And um, you know the the relinking of blocks of habitat through these buffers and corridors of habitat, the the kind of reconnecting of currently disconnected habitat areas um, is a big part of this work. And partly that's because both plants and animals are on the move with climate change, right? So this is a map of how the kind of ideal suitable zone for agriculture and life and everything is moving northward in the US. And that means, hey, look, we're going to be in it in 50 years. Um, so in some ways, you know, our growing season is going to be longer. Um, there's crops we'll be able to grow here that we can't grow currently, but we'll also be in this erratic flood drought cycle and a lot of other stresses too. So, you know, there's these species from the south that are going to take up residence here. And so, you know, what we've experienced with introduced plant and animal species so far is a tiny fraction of what's coming. Um, and, you know, and I, I think there's, there's emotional work to do to reckon with that as well as ecosystem work because of our familiarity with what we grew up with and what we associate with home. So uh, I'm going to skip this one, but this is just about all the diversity in your garden and how that's pretty essential for the survival of life too. Um, so biodiversity, you know, what's their, what's their intensifying support for biodiversity within what you have influence on? So then sea level rise. Okay, you might think, well, gosh, we're not on the coast. Um, this might not have a lot to do with the region where we live, and that's true in a direct way. Um, you know, but we really have to consider what this young woman is saying here from Tuvalu. She says to the rest of the world, please, could you prepare a place for my country to stay? So I want to propose that some of the most significant climate adaptation work for regions that are not at the climate front lines has to do with work of democracy and community. So we can reasonably expect at least half a billion people to be displaced worldwide this in this coming century by 2100. And but by the devastation of climate change, and some of that is across borders, you know, including people like this person we just saw who will not necessarily even have a country anymore because of sea level rise. Um, and also within countries, you know, there's expected to be at least 20 to 30 million people displaced internally within the US by climate change in the next 20 to 30 years. So this poses some really significant climate adaptation questions. And, you know, I want to propose that in a, in a difficult to sit with way, um, you know, the militarized border, you know, concentration camps of migrant people, that is climate adaptation policy. But it's white nationalist climate adaptation policy. It's climate adaptation policy that is about protecting the resources we have and making sure that they're not able to be shared. And so, you know, some questions to grapple with and not saying that there's right answers to these questions, but one of them is how will you and your community be in relationship to the reality of mass migration of people? Because it will be happening whether or not we see it personally. What is your moral and ethical orientation to mass, my, to mass movement of people? And what planning questions have to be grappled with as a community in light of all this? Right? So these are posed as the, the questions that are implied by our situation, right? And not to impose a answer on anyone here, but to say that the questions are knocking at our door. And, and so what I want to do is, you know, I think we're not going to probably have time to go back into this last breakout room, but I want to have a few moments of thinking about this idea of working at a weak link. So this is another holistic management idea. So Think again about your whole under management. Think about the entities and systems that you could influence through organizing and collaborating with other people. What is a noticeably weak link that you can see in the ability of the systems around you to adapt to climate change that you are in a position to influence or even change outright? What is a noticeably weak link in the systems around you 
in their ability to adapt that you might be able to influence or change. And then what friends, allies, and capabilities would be required to take that on? What leadership would you have to step into? What leadership would you have to you know, exert and embody? So I'd love to invite people to just spend a couple minutes thinking about this. And it's a tricky thing to share these ideas because often they're like little campfires that'll knock over in the wind. And there's an important thing about allowing ideas to mature, like allowing a campfire to grow to the point that it can sustain itself. So I don't wanna push anyone into sharing something that's a little young to be shared right now, but if you have a glimpse of, I think I could work on that. And I really want to encourage you to think beyond what you have already worked on. Beyond what, beyond the organizations that you're already a part of, beyond the efforts you've already engaged. What's a new thought that's forming about maybe that's something I could take on? Because my proposal is that our situation requires new thoughts and it requires going beyond what we've attempted so far. have a few minutes to think about that. And if, if there's things you're, that are coming to your mind, feel free to put them in the chat. Ah, uh -huh. interesting thought here from Anna, a green new deal from below using the people and experiences and resources of our area. Right. So what would it be like to imagine a, to imagine kind of a whole systems policy strategy for a place, for a region, right? How could that be developed? What conversations would make that possible, right? And the Green New Deal as a concept was itself developed through coalitions of people in conversation over many years and it was led by young people, right? It was led by, it was led by environmental, race, environmental justice and, and against environmental racism movements. It was led by the Sunrise Movement and you know, the people who are kind of most affected by climate change. So those are, that's a really interesting thought. Um, someone says, I'm interested in working on and preparing for more cross-cultural collaboration locally. Yeah, yeah, what does that look like? What does that ask and require of us? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, a potential weak link, our resistance to increase development to accommodate people moving into the region, right? There's a big tension there, isn't, it? isn't there? Thank you for saying that, Kim. So, you know, there is a tension between keeping things the same and the world around us changing. And there's also a tension between, um, you know, the tendency of our current economic system to concentrate the wealth effects of whatever is happening. So, you know, it's not necessarily just a question of increasing the amount of development because we know what that does in a lot of cases. We know what that does to, we know that that does to inequality. Um, but so people are talking about needing more planning for future housing development, right? What is a what is a deeply climate adaptive paradigm for regional planning? And what is, a, what is a paradigm for regional planning that takes as a starting point that the future is gonna be radically different? Yeah. Okay, Polo is saying education K-12 around climate adaptation as relates to place both Western and indigenous in nature, right? Right, because the younger generations are targeted by this situation. They are really deeply in the crosshairs of this situation because they will live with it longer. And that means that they will live with worsening effects that we won't see. So the question of, you know, one of my, one of my kind of teachers and leaders around education, you know, he poses the question of, you know, if our schools aren't engaging with the biggest things happening in the worlds and lives of their students, what are we really doing? You know, so if our, if our schools and kind of communities where young people gather aren't allowing for an engagement with the realities of climate change and the realities of living in a cross multicultural world, um, there's, so much, there's so much power there to explore. Okay, right, interesting. The collapse of mills meant less development pressure. It gives us time for, that's very, that's a very fascinating observation, Joanne, that there's a, there's this, there's this legacy of deindustrialization in this place. And 
that that's been related to the idea of North Quabbin as a buffer region that someone was talking about between Boston and points west. Um, it, it gets skipped over because it's essentially sort of, you know, it's a water tank hooked up to the city from, from the, a certain point of view. Um, so there's an opportunity provided by that. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. You know, what, what, what can we do with the time we're given? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are talking about land access for gardening, right? Food sovereignty, there's no access to water. And, you know, when there's no access to water, it's generally because it's generally because the access to water hasn't been designed, right? Because there is, thank goodness, plentiful groundwater in this region. There is also droughts notwithstanding, there is plentiful rainwater. So there's water above ground and below ground, but how to get it to where it's needed, that's a, that's a design question. And that sometimes is a question that requires coalitions because of permissions and legalities and money. Yeah. Yeah, moral issues about water. We have plenty. Are we going to share with others? Right, and in an interesting way, Joanne, this region already is sharing with others, right? It's actually providing water to multiple millions of people. Um, so where does that go? Susan says, I want to learn about what, who's already doing what and move forward from there in a concerted way. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and if I can just add something to that idea, Susan, I want to introduce the a thought in our closing minutes here of self-organization, which is a property of ecosystems. It's a property of natural ecologies. And self-organization works through principles of attraction and repulsion, right? It works through elements in a system coming together, being drawn together and interacting and being in relationship and other elements in the system being repelled from each other. And so I think there's an important perspective in climate work that can hold the, the fact that there are multiple and divergent realities about what we need to be working on. And can hold the fact that people are gonna work on widely divergent things and that it may not actually be necessary or even possible to have everyone agree. And so in a world where, in a world where agreement and unification aren't possible, what does it look like to move forward in concert like you're saying? And what does it look like also to, at times that are good to do this, set aside individualism and follow the leadership of other people? Yeah, and any communities that have already engaged with this have systems in response to the idea of building refuges, right? What, what does it mean to become a refuge or to deepen as a refuge? That's a very powerful question. So we're about at time, good folks. This has been a really, really rich conversation over chat and text here just these last few minutes. And I hope that some things are stirring for you in the question of where this place could go, or if you're visiting from another region where these kinds of conversations could go where you are. Um, I don't want to enclose where this could go. And I know a lot of people here have pre-existing relationships with each other. So um, I'm really grateful for your generous time this evening in looking at some, looking at some hard things in our future and present and, and applying some design thinking and applying some creative thinking to what we could do about them. Um, and I want to see if, uh, if anyone from Mount Grace wants to say any closing words before we call it a night. Thanks, Connor. Yes. So we did record this entire workshop and it will be available after editing. So if you wanted to view it at a later time, I wanted uh, to echo all of the comments. Thank you so much, Connor, for facilitating this talk. It was great. Um, and I think we all have a, a lot to think about now in terms of how to work around climate change in our communities. Thank you everyone for participating. Uh, you will be receiving an email uh, with more information from us in the future. Oh, we're, we're going we're gonna to save the chat record too, so that we have documentation of some of these, some of these ideas and questions. Okay, well with that, have a good night everyone.
Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming.